Good evening all, and welcome. This video has been graciously sponsored by Skillshare. Make 2020 a year where you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's online classes. Skillshare is an online learning community with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. These can include photography, how to record audiobooks, video creation, and even poise spinning, which is what I have been learning with Ben Draxler. If any of you guys are interested in flow arts, I really recommend him, he's super talented. Not to mention that Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, at less than $10 a month. And to make it even more affordable, the first 500 of you guys to click the link in the description will get two free months of premium membership, so you can explore your creativity to your heart's content. Go on, I already do. So click the link for two free months, you won't regret it. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I thought I would share with you about my life as a VBSS operator on board the USS Gary. Basically, a VBSS team is a part-time volunteer job within the US Navy. It stands for Visit board, search, and seizure. And as the name states, we visit enemy ships, board them, search them, and seize them of all suspicious activity. We mainly focus on counter piracy slash smuggling. However, we do conduct other missions such as hostage rescue and other things that should be remained classified. The job is a part time job, one you do on the side while you have your main job on board the ship. However, I was one of the few that solely did VBSS. Well, let me correct that. I had another job. I was an undesignated seaman. However, I carried out duties on that job maybe one day a week. I will try and tell you some weird and creepy things that happened during my time in the Navy while still staying inside the limits of information I'm allowed to tell. Keep in mind these stories are few and far between, and most of our missions consisted of arriving at boats and arresting innocent guys who were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. The first one I'm going to share with you was about five years ago. We got a call that a boat had been spotted about a half mile out from the ship, and we were to get geared up. As VBSS, our gear consists of an M4 assault rifle a Sig Saura P226 handgun, a combat knife, three mags of ammo and a helmet. We got geared up and entered our rubber riding craft. I remember specifically on this day, I had a terrible headache, and focusing was very hard for me. I remember my petty officer looked over at me as we were closing in on the boat, and said I looked like I was taking it up the arse. As we got up to the boat, we saw four men, unarmed, and they looked to be about 50 years old. After realizing they weren't a threat, we just handcuffed them, and my teammate asked them what they were doing this far out at sea. The man responded that they were running from the powerful one. We didn't know what the hell they were talking about, so when we asked them for further information, one of them said they were just on a fishing trip yesterday off the coast, and a fog came over them, and the powerful one teleported them here. Okay, well, there was no way they could have gone from a few miles off the coast to 500 miles out at sea in a day. The men looked visibly shaken, and one of them even had a fresh gash down the back that he claimed was caused by the powerful one. I don't know if they were crazy or something is actually out there, but either way, it gave us a good scare. The next story was about two years ago. This story still gives me goosebumps to this day, because it was one of the very few actual gunfights I have been in. I'm not talking about a few warning shots or injury shots, 
I mean a fully-fledged firefight between us and the enemy. Every combat veteran knows what I'm talking about when I say there are no atheists in a gunfight. But anyway, we received a call that armed pirates were spotted a mile off from the ship, smuggling unknown bagged contents, and that we needed to take them into custody. Even though they were armed, none of us expected to get into a firefight because we came across armed men all the time, and most of them just ditch their guns into the ocean to rid themselves of evidence, which is a smart move if you ask me. However, these men didn't. As soon as we zeroed in on their craft, we receive immediate enemy fire. As experienced operators, I can officially say we all crapped ourselves. Yes, a normal gunfight is scary, but in the middle of the ocean, on a motorized watercraft with no protective walls, you are basically a sitting duck. We all flat bellied, just waiting for our craft to get penetrated with a bullet for us to sink. One of my teammates got up in a kneel position and returned fire. And when he did, I guess it struck a bit of bravery in all of us as we did the same. As VBSS operators, we are taught to shoot to wound, never to kill, because our job is not to kill. Our job is to capture and allow higher ups to gather intel from interrogation. There were 10 gunmen on the enemy boat, and 13 of us. I remember I got one of the pirates in the knee. One of my teammates and still good friends to this day, Henry, got hit in the thigh and couldn't do anything for about six months. Eventually, we couldn't hold any longer, and a helicopter was called in, and they got gunned down. Thankfully, no one died, but it was still a frightening and terrifying experience. This story is probably one of the more creepy and bone-chilling ones on the list, just due to the fact there was no rational explanation for it. Like normal, we got a call that there was a suspicious vessel and that we needed to check it out. This was different though, because we were working with a cargo ship. Working with big ships is always scary, because of all that can go wrong, and you always have that feeling that there was some place you missed or didn't check. Since the hull of this ship was elevated, we had to be helicoptered in. So we got loaded up and got into the helicopter. It was about a 20 minute ride out to where the ship was. And when we got to it, we fast roped out on deck. There wasn't anyone on the top deck, which we found weird, especially for a ship of this size and this far out at sea. After conducting search protocol for a good half hour on the top deck and bridge, and finding absolutely no one, we assumed that maybe they had caught our ship on their radar system and went to hide under deck. We went down below, and to make a long story short, we didn't find anyone there either. The entire team was baffled. There was absolutely no way a ship around 600 miles out in the Atlantic could have gotten there unmanned. We started looking inside large freight crates and still found nothing. No one knew how this was possible. And then our lieutenant called us over to come to look at something that he had found. There was a piece of paper and very poorly etched into the paper was the words, help us. This freaked us out. I'm not sure what exactly happened to the ship after we left, but I couldn't get off it quick enough. I remember that night, I sat in my room contemplating quitting. It's the only time I have ever truly considered it. As VBSS operators, we are taught that when conducting a search, to never have your weapon safety on until right before you engage an enemy. You will see where I'm going with this in a second. This story isn't very long, nor is it very shocking, but I thought it was interesting enough to share. We were conducting an op on a small fishing vessel, and the way it was set up was me and my buddy were going to board first, while the others waited for us to clear it out. Now that I think about it, it was a stupid move, because if there had been 10 armed pirates on the boat, we would have been dead. 
But nonetheless, we did as we were told. We had boarded, and I was covering my buddy six while we were about to turn into a doorway leading into the bridge. When we were about 10 feet from the door, a man all of a sudden bolts from around the corner, and it terrified us. My buddy had his safety off and accidentally pulled the trigger and got the dude right in the head. Man, was that a shit show. The Navy had to pay quite a bit to the family and my buddy ended up getting court martialed. He ended up not getting discharged and got to return to active duty. But still, it was a damn mess. This is one of the more creepy ones and was actually pretty recent. Like how most of these stories start, we got a call saying there was an unidentified craft close by. When we arrived to the boat, there were six men on it. We went through procedure, yelling with our guns pointed. Basically the Navy's way of letting enemies know our dick is bigger. And when they were contained, Petty Officer asked them what they were doing. One of them came forward and said how they were heading out to an oil rig, but ended up getting tailed by a North Korean submarine and that they were being followed. They said they had seen the big flag painted on the side of the bridge and everything. We thought nothing of it because we knew North Korea carried out very, very few naval operations. And when they did, it was never outside their own waters in very small submarines not capable of locking onto any object. We were out in the middle of the Atlantic. And after taking the men on board the Gary, our rear admiral told us that they had picked up a submarine of quite substantial size on their radar. However, it disappeared before they could do anything. He told us it was unlike anything they had seen before, because a submarine of that size could not go stealth like that. It really makes you wonder, what if North Korea is capable of more than we think? Who knows what secrets they're keeping hidden over there. As I've stated before, the life of a VBSS operator is never easy. And if you're wanting to do this job, I suggest you prepare yourselves for the best way you can. In some way, I would say it's even harder than what Marines and soldiers have to do. I'm in no way disrespecting the incredibly hard stuff they have to go through. However, in the VBSS world, the ocean can make things a lot more difficult. This story I'm about to tell you happened around four years ago, when I was still pretty new to the Navy. Just like most of these stories start out, the commanding officer of the Gary told us a pirate vessel had been spotted not too far from our ship. He told us this call was not like any other call though. He told us they could have a potential hostage with them and could be hostile. Now, normally when this happens, they usually call in more experienced and better trained men like Navy SEALs and Marine Maritime Raid Forces. But for whatever reason, they deemed us able to carry out the mission. We were all ready. However, every one of us would be lying if we said we weren't secretly shitting ourselves, especially me still being considered the new guy on the team. We got geared up and headed out as soon as we could. Hostage situations are always more intense due to the fact that someone's life is at stake and it is a no fail mission. We had a helicopter escort with an a 0.50 cal door gun locked and loaded on overwatch in case stuff went south. It took us about seven minutes to arrive to the vessel. And as soon as we got there, we immediately started taking action. We began pointing our guns at the armed men on the boat, screaming your typical orders like get down or hands above your head. You'd be surprised how much we sound like police officers at times. We all expected them to either return fire or resist. However, they didn't. They didn't follow our orders, but they put their guns down and just stood there looking at us. We were all weirded out by this, but we did not let this opportunity go. We rushed the deck, detained every man we could find and went to receive the package, military slang for rescue the hostage. We found her below deck. She looked to be around 19, African ethnicity and beaten up pretty badly. 
We immediately got her on our craft and started speeding back to the USS Gary as quickly as we could. She started mumbling an inaudible message, but we pretty quickly made out the words, watch out. It was at that very moment we heard the helicopters, 0.50 cal start unloading behind us. When we were getting back to the ship and spoke to the helicopter pilots, they told us that as we were heading back, a hidden man had crept up from below deck and was aiming an RPG at our craft. Needless to say, that scared the crap out of all of us. And I still say to this day, if it had not been for whoever was manning that door gun, me and my teammates would not be alive today. The next story is on the creepier side. It will definitely make you wonder. It was about a year and a half ago. We get a call, pirate spotted. Everything is normal. We suit up head out with a helicopter escorting us to provide information back to the Gary, and we arrived at the boat the pirates were on. However, upon further inspection, we realize that there is no one on the boat. All of us are baffled. And when we radio up the chopper to ask what the hell is up, he says he had eyes on them, looked away for a second. And when he looked back, they were all gone like they had never been there. The helicopter usually arrives a few minutes before we do, so he can scout the area out. And he swore that when he arrived, they were on the boat and seconds before he looked away and they were gone. No one can explain what happened to this day. And we never found out what happened to the men who were on that boat. This next story takes place around a year ago. Being a specialized group in the US Navy, sometimes as VBSS operators, we get to work with Navy SEALs. However, it is extremely rare. And when we do, it's usually just a training exercise. But this time was different. It was the real deal. We never take these opportunities lightly and are always 100% serious due to the fact that these guys are amazing at what they do. Let me tell you, if you ever get a chance to do anything with a Navy SEAL, take that opportunity. They are some of the most class guys I have and ever will meet. Not to mention how amazingly trained and highly skilled operators they are. This particular call was to attach to a SEAL unit and conduct a close quarters raid on an undocumented whaling ship with armed crew members that was holding something the Navy wanted. We weren't allowed to know what they were looking for. And to this day, I still don't know exactly what the SEALs were supposed to be looking for, but we carried out our job regardless. Now our job was to basically be at the SEALs backs and aid them in anything they needed while they did the dirty work. We all got geared up and began our operation. The SEALs arrived via helicopter assertion, and we did our usual watercraft approach. There were 20 of the VBSS men, including myself and about eight seals. We climbed up the side of the hull and entered the deck using a grapple ladder. And just to give you guys a peek at how amazing the seals are, there were probably about 15 armed men on the deck alone. And in the short 30 seconds it took us to get there, the eight Navy seals had already detained every single one of them and were on their way below deck. We kept watch on deck while the SEALs were conducting their mission. We were up there and just waited for a good hour. And all of a sudden, the SEALs come bursting out the door that leads below deck, holding something that looks to be a body bag. Whoever or whatever was in that bag was squirming violently and making inhuman noises. When we arrived back at the Gary, we were immediately led to a room on the ship that I had never seen before or since and firmly instructed to never speak about what we saw to anyone. I very well may be stepping out of line telling this story. But I think the public needs to know that there is a lot. And I mean, a lot of things the military and government are hiding from you. This next story is kind of weird, because it was kind of creepy. But at the same time was just very odd. I was sitting in my room during my rest period with a few other guys on the VBSS team listening to Nickelback. 
I know, I know, we have awful taste in music. But the way the particular song was playing, How You Remind Me, not that it's important, but it's a great song, you should listen to it. And just talking about random stuff. All of a sudden, our lieutenant bursts through the door and tells us to get suited up, because there were three pirate crafts pursuing the ship. We sprung to our feet, and immediately met up with the rest of the team on deck. We were not going to be leaving the deck, which was relieving, but we were going to engage the craft if they got too close to the ship. We split up into three teams of five, one for each craft. Each team had a different colour name, red, blue, and yellow. The blue team went to the port side of the ship and aimed our weapons at one of the crafts. We started screaming at them to drop their weapons and put their hands up. However, they did not obey and kept coming closer to the ship. Eventually, I heard the lieutenant scream engage, and we began firing. Here's the weird part though. We began firing at them, and it was like we weren't even hitting them. I thought we were just missing, but then I looked harder in my scope, and made sure I nailed the guy right in the leg, and I know I hit him even to this day, but it didn't even create a wound. The guy didn't flinch. They just stared at us. I looked over at my buddy and asked him what the hell was going on, and he looked just as confused as I did. I yelled out to the other teams if the same thing was happening to them, and they said that none of their bullets were doing anything. It was at that moment, all of a sudden, all three pirate crafts turned around and sped off in the direction they came. We were all left speechless, and stood there looking at each other for a good five minutes, just trying to comprehend what we had experienced. Still, no one knows what was causing those men to not be affected by all of the M4 5.56 bullets, and we have not experienced anything similar since. Back in high school, before I enlisted, I knew this guy named Corey. We were never best friends, but we spoke occasionally. He was a quieter kid, but every now and then, when we did talk, the subject of him moving away after high school to Somalia and becoming a freedom fighter against their awful government came up. Always thought he was kind of crazy, but I always laughed and told him to go for it, because who knew how Somalia needed help? Well, about two and a half years ago, while the Gary is conducting operations near the coast of Somalia, we get a call that a pirate vessel was circling the ship. We got geared up, and upon arriving to the vessel, we began detaining the men on the boat. And guess who I see on the boat with three other pirates? Good old Corey. I asked him how the hell he got into pirating, and he just looked at me. Never thought I would have run into crazy Corey, or that he would have actually gone through with his plans, let alone me running to him seven years down the road halfway across the world. I never found out what happened to him, but it still amazes me to this day that something so unlikely would happen. I'm in the Navy, and I currently work on a base which encompasses an island called Saint Clement Island. The island itself is mostly deserted and untouched, but on the north end of the island is a town, for lack of a better word, where the navy and contractors live. One night I was heading down to relieve a co-worker from watch. As I'm driving down the road, which is mostly pitch black, I see a figure in the street in my headlights. Naturally, I slam the brakes. I begin cussing up a storm, because some idiot is walking in the middle of the road at night. Shortly after, however, I noticed it isn't a person, but more of a solid shadow. You could make up no features on it, but it had mass and was human-shaped. It was in the middle of the road, sort of stomping, almost like a weird dance. Then suddenly it was just gone. It didn't fade away, didn't do anything dramatic. It was just gone. I freaked out, and told a lot of my co-workers who didn't believe me. I never saw it again, but holy crap was I afraid. I've heard stories of people on the island having doors in their work areas open, and stuff on their own, but no stories similar to mine. 
I don't know much about the history of the island itself, but I do know at some point it was owned by Native Americans, and often remains of them are found or unearthed, often buried with the remains of foxes. I was in class with a few military police officers, and heard some stories. There were multiple times where they would get calls or alarms going off in parts of the hangars we work, and when they responded, no one is in the hangar anywhere near the phone or in the room the call came from. One guy that worked the dispatch desk at night said for two weeks straight, he'd get a call at exactly 3.15 every morning and there would be no sound whatsoever. He left the phone on for five minutes to listen for any sound and there'd be nothing. Not a dial tone, breathing or background noise. Nothing. Another was when they would exercise or train on the weekend in our hangars, and they would see things move around the aircraft or across the hangar from where they are. When they would investigate, there wouldn't be anyone in there with them. It wasn't any of us, because we didn't work nights on weekends. The last one. My base is next to a mountain, and one section of it extends all the way to the base and up the side of the mountain. All along that area are little silos or channels running into the mountain. None of them are used, and they're all locked up tight, have been for years. One night, they got an alarm going off in one of those little channels, and were sent to investigate. Shortly after the alarm, they got a phone call from there, and when they picked up, the line went dead. When they arrived, the door was locked as usual, and showed no signs it had ever been messed with within the last 10 years. They opened the door and took a look inside. There was a ladder that went down a lower room, and inside that room, there were signs that someone was living there, and they seemed fresh. A few bottles of water, a foam pad to sleep on, some bags. None of it seemed to have dust or anything. As soon as they saw it, they left and locked it up tight. They had security sit there till morning, and had someone come out to chain the door shut. I'm a military officer and have seen my fair share of crazy. Back in 2010, when I was still a sergeant, I was out on a training mission with my unit. We had all the gear packed up since we were going to stay in the wild for a few nights. We go deep into a forest out in nowhere, Minnesota. The nearest house must have been at least a two hour drive away, and there was no signal. We set up camp and start to make ready for the first exercise. When we are all done with the exercise, we have to make dinner, which is nothing to say hooray about. It was just some MRI. God, I hate that food. As we ate our food, we head off to bed so that we could get up at four in the morning. Five people were pointed out to guard in switch. I had the guard at two in the morning. All the other guards were reporting strange noises from the woods. They said it sounded like someone talking to each other and walking around. We are all a bit scared, even though we had our guns. An hour into my guard switch, I hear the voice. I point my gun into the area of the sound. I don't dare say anything. So I slowly back up to wake up the others. As I got up the staff sergeant, five shots fire. Needless to say, everyone is awake now. People are scrambling for their guns. In a matter of minutes, everyone is ready and a hunt begins. We are all ordered to go out and capture whoever shot at us. After searching most of the night, we were going to call it at that. But one of the specialists had found an old and rundown looking house in the forest. We go and search the house. Six soldiers go in and search while 20 others are guarding all exits. We found no one inside but it looked to be a meth lab. So, what I think of this story, I think it was some crackheads that were cooking meth there, and they thought for some random reason that we were campers, and when they saw soldiers, they ran for it. I'm a former US Marine. During a field training event, 
we were doing night live fire drills. I was cresting a small berm. And when I did, there was a loud mechanical whirring of the pop up targets coming up. So I went through the metal drills of hitting the ground in a relatively safe manner to take a shot at the pop up target. I took another step and put my hand out right hand on rifle, left hand out slightly from my body. And I lost all balance. I hit the ground and heard crack thump. Nothing unusual about that on a firing range, followed up by ceasefire man down. I look around at a bunch of stuff standing over me asking if I was okay. I was fine. Why would they ask? I take off my helmet and see that a guy in my fire team has fired me mistaking me for a pop up. The round glanced off my helmet and tore a hole in it. I took no damage but due to a faulty helmet, I had to stay behind on all further runs. As I was doing something near my tent, I heard a voice say, that was close. Next time you should stay behind Parker. I laugh and say, yeah, I turned to where I heard the voice. And there was no one there. I searched the area there was no one around. This freaked me out and would have been enough to keep me on edge. But I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. Fine, cool, whatever. Six months later, and we're balls deep in house clearing bullshit in a run. I hear that very same voice. Remember to stay behind Parker, right before we enter the house. I take a look behind me. And sure enough, the guy was right behind me. I take a step to the side acting like I was doing something and he instinctively moved forward. I duck him behind him. Unfortunately, he didn't make it through the house. To this day, I blame myself for his passing. I never stopped thinking about what may have been. I know if I'd have gone in first, I wouldn't be writing this if I'd have been in his place. I know it's not right to blame myself, but I do. Maybe it is right. All I know now is whenever I hear that voice saying remember, don't take lead or something like that. I listen. I've heard it twice since that day. Hate me if you like. I hate myself enough for listening to that voice already. My boyfriend was in the army before I met him. This is by far the creepiest story he shared with me. He lived in a two story townhouse on base housing in Fort Hood for about six months. Tenants always came and went because of deployment. Weird stuff would happen both at night and during the day, mainly thuds in his bedroom on the second floor and shuffling. He felt uneasy being in his room. He also always slept in the living room couch on the first floor. On the weekends, he would be up late playing Xbox, being the achievement hunter he is, and due to insomnia, wouldn't fall asleep until 5am. One night he was up late on his Xbox dashboard, sitting on the sofa chair smoking a cigarette. His connect was plugged in. As many of you know, there's a screen on the bottom right corner that shows an infrared version of what the connect camera can see. This lets you know that it is detecting. It's really sensitive. And although it is sometimes frustrating to use surprisingly accurate. This is when the hair behind his neck stood up. He noticed the infrared screen. Standing to the right of him alongside him was a solid female figure. He wanted to add that he has never used his connect after this, even after moving back home to Chicago. I can attest to that. When I was in Iraq, we were on patrol one night and stopped at an intersection pulling perimeter support for another unit who had requested assistance in our area. The mission went off without a hitch and it was honestly a little boring just waiting around. Then it got really quiet. This was in Baghdad in the city. It's never really quiet, even at night. But it was as if all the sound was sucked out the area. Suddenly the entire block lost power, and it was very dark. 
Within seconds of the power going out, close to what I can guess was about 50 dogs flooded the streets from an alley and ran around our Humvees. They didn't bark, just growled as they ran. As soon as they entered another alley and out of sight, the power came back on and all the normal city noise returned. It was incredibly unnerving like a horde of demons had just passed us in the form of dogs. Back when I was in boot camp, I was sent to an island called Pulau Tekong, off the coast of Singapore. This island's entire population is made up of only military personnel or afflicted people, and there were no animals allowed into the camp, and security is posted 24-7. To even get there, we had to take a ferry for 10 minutes with our bags checked before we could head on the ferry and checked again after we reached the company line. I remember that this night was particularly cooling and around 10 p.m. it started to rain. My platoon was on the fifth floor of the building and sometime around 3 a.m. I was jolted awake. There was an unmistakable sound of cats meowing on the floor at first, I thought I was dreaming, but they started to get louder. I sleep facing the window of our bunk, but there was a thick mist outside even though it was raining. My vision into the hallway was severely limited, and I was shocked by this and look around the bunk to see three other section mates awake as well. We look at each other and started asking what was happening in our hall. In the midst of talking, there was a loud screech that pierced the meowing cats, almost as if someone dragged their nails across a chalkboard. Through the thick mist, a few figures ran past my bunk, too blurry to actually make out what they were, due to the screech. The entire platoon woke up and ran into the hall, where the mist seemed to quickly retreat. The next morning, we looked in the hallway, and there were paw prints in our bathroom, even on the ceiling. The second story happened after I got posted to the unit, after completing boot camp. Back in 2017, there was a shooting competition between Asian countries, and Singapore was playing host. My camp was where the ammunition and pistols came from, and I was the duty vehicular man during one of the weeks. I was told that I was needed at the ammo point at 2 to 4 a.m. every morning, along with the duty clerk for the day to clear the personnel that were coming to collect ammo. The ammo point is located on a hill, about four clicks away from headquarters. This particular morning, it was around 12.30, and after getting confirmation that an escort into the ammo point was not required, I started the vehicle and began making the drive back to HQ with the clerk beside me. You know how motion lights work. When you walk into a room, they'll light up, and after a while, if you leave, they'll turn off. While the road back to HQ was littered with street lamps with motion sensor lights. As I started making my way down the hill, with nothing but foliage on both sides, the lights I passed started going one by one with a deafening sound. It immediately started to get cold, which is something that never happens in Singapore due to the humidity. I looked at the clerk and told him something felt off and that I was getting goosebumps. A primal sense of fear took over me as I realized that something might be trying to get us. I zoomed down the hill with the lights going off behind us one by one, and it seemed to be getting faster, almost as if we were being chased. We did make it back to HQ, and it was here that we realized that it wasn't cold like how it was back then. I asked a warrant officer, who had been posted there about the general area of the ammo point, and he told me that the music and drama company's building, which is about 500 meters away from the ammo point, is haunted, and because of what I went through, they had to get a religious leader to come and bless the building again. I have served in the United States military, as a petty officer in the Navy, and as a master at arms. 
I served the entirety of my tour in Okinawa, Japan, which, if you're in the Navy, is one of the most boring billets out there. The first year and a half there, I probably only had two calls, both being medical emergencies. We have three tiny bases that absolutely almost nothing happens on and a small little patch of land on the largest base of the island, Cadena, Joint Air Base, for our offices and headquarters. So the entirety of us, Master of Arms, are split into different sections for obvious reasons. This didn't happen to me, but my section was on shift the night it did and I had an almost front row seat for the entire thing. At night, we have to make multiple rounds to make sure our buildings are locked and that no one is trying to break in. Again, I'm not gonna say how or when, but on this night, we had at least already made a check on the building. So we knew that everything was okay. So the group I'm assigned to is on the Camp Shields, which is right down the road from the base and where we come from in order to do our checks. Since the buildings are on Cadena, the Air Force security also patrols the area and usually helps us out. One night we get a call from the Air Force dispatcher and they say they had just received a call from our HQ building. No one spoke on the other end, but it was a solid 10 seconds of silence before the dispatcher heard the phone get hung up. A supervisor for our group Another higher ranking petty officer who I've worked with for a while and is a super cool dude takes one of the other guys and they load up and zip over there. When they come around the bend to where the buildings are, the first thing they see is our HQ and that one of the side doors is wide open and it's nothing but pitch black inside. Again, we had checked the buildings earlier and knew that this door was shut, locked and secure. So what was probably the first time in what legitimately had to be at least 10 years, our officers drew their weapons and cleared the building for a real life situation. It may not shock any of you to learn they didn't find anyone or anything out of place. There is a pretty good chance that the whole thing was a prank, but Okinawa is one of the most haunted places on earth. And that place is super creepy at night, even with another person and a gun. As a little fun side story, one night I was assigned there. I happened to not be fully geared up for reasons and we happened to be short staffed that night as well. And because needs and musts, we had to check the building and only I was available, alone, with nothing but a flashlight. And I had to walk around between these buildings in the middle of the night in the pitch darkness. And I don't mind admitting I was terrified. I was rounding the corner to the front of HQ, and all of a sudden I hear pounding feet darting towards me. I jump about a mile in the air, fumble the flashlight, and I'm jerking myself in all directions to try and find whoever it is. I realize after a moment that the sound is still going on, and I look up to see the flag flapping in the wind. Honestly, not one of my best moments. There are tons of stories and urban legends on the base as well. If you Google images to search CFAO Headquarters Okinawa, the very first result is RHQ. You can see the flagpole of doom. I have a number of stories about my time in the armed forces. This one is from basic training. Fort Benning just got back a few months ago. We had this one private who was getting medically discharged due to some physical defect, despite being ripped out of his mind. This little dude was on his way out. But if anyone here has ever gotten discharged from basic, you know, it's a long process. So one night we got messed up pretty hard by a drill sergeant who will hereby be referred to as DS. So DS was a master mind messer. And that's exactly what he did to us that night. He finally called it a night and let us go to sleep. Well, private crazy is still all pissed. I mean, he's leaving. Why does he have to get so messed up? 
So he's pissed and walks around after lights out. So one of the privates in the bunk next to him, a private well known to be an unapologetic ass, tells him to shut the hell up. So Private Crazy kicks this other guy's bed, and that guy responds with, Wow, you're a hard ass. And after that, Private Crazy says he doesn't remember a thing. Private Crazy starts walking around the kill zone. He goes over to the workout area and starts lifting. People ignore it, whatever, he's just blowing off steam. Then he does a tribal war dance. He was of Islander descent, and now people are telling him to be quiet. Then, barefooted, he walks back into the kill zone and up to one of the pillars. He starts kicking the pillar until his foot is bleeding. Now people are just like, what are you doing? After he's done proving the point he had with the pillar, he sits down in the center of the room with 50 men. He just sits down and guess whose bunk he's staring at? Private ass. Private Crazy starts saying in a high pitch and unnatural tone, the private's last name, and says, eight minutes. Everyone starts panicking. Private Crazy get up, suddenly cuts himself on some rope that we keep in the bay for a wider range of reasons, goes back to the other private's bed and starts staring at him until he's shouting in unnatural voices. Out of nowhere, Private Crazy jumped out the window. A bunch of guys stopped him and started dragging him to DS his office. He comes out and asks what the hell is going on. Well, the only answer is that Private Crazy threw his entire jar of marbles off a bridge. He calls the military police, and it takes six men, all whom are bigger than Private Crazy, to take him downstairs. Once they're down, he got loose. But luckily, Private Biceps, one of the biggest guys in the platoon, came down to tackle him. The entire time he's yelling the original guy's name. So when the military police show up and slap the cuffs on, he blinks and bam, back to normal. He had no idea what happened. Mind you, that's only the first story. This story messed me up. It didn't happen in my platoon's bay, and I don't remember which platoon it did happen to, but the only thing I remember from this story is that the only two witnesses to it were literally frozen with fear, so much so they couldn't move or speak. Two guys were laying in a bed on the top bunks, and neither could fall asleep. Fireguard was sitting at the desk talking and laughing. Their DS must not have been on the CQ that night, so they were looking around the bay when they both saw it. How they both described it was that it was almost amorphous. This thing, except with a weird arm with claws, but looked like some sort of shadow death creature. It didn't look solid, but they could also tell it wasn't entirely incorporeal. They watched it as it slowly pulled itself onto the lockers across the room with its single long arm, inch forward onto the lockers and then let itself fall to the ground, and then repeat this on the next locker and the next, but it was silent as it did so. These two privates were damn near crapping themselves, and eventually it just disappeared. In a comedic note, another platoon, who was seeing this too, asked their DS what the deal was. His response was, well, I guess it's haunted. Finally, this is a fireguard story. Two of my buddies are on fire guard, and they're making their rounds. Well, this one guy literally took a half hour in the bathroom. After the guy in the bathroom finishes up, he steps out of the stall and he sees his partner for the shift. He freezes, and I mean it's kind of awkward, since he's just done doing what he's doing, so he assumed he heard when things got weird. So slowly, with shame, he says the guy's name to no response. The first guy asks the second what he's doing in there. Well, I guess that shook him, so he comes and says, Oh, I saw something in the kill zone, so I came here to wait for you. He's freaked out and asks him to explain. So he says, Well, I was watching the door, but when I looked in the kill zone, I saw 
these kids playing there. So they checked and it was clear. But from that point, they didn't make rounds around the kill zone. They just stayed at the desk. But as they were walking back to the front, the first private looks out the window to one of the balconies outside where the chairs and such were for when the DSs need a break. He looked out and thought he saw someone sitting in a chair. He walked over to the window to make sure it was a DS, but then realized there was no one there. I was doing guard duty in the army one night. We had some training exercise in an abandoned camp facility. And my buddy and I had been assigned to watch over some vehicles that we had parked in a large empty warehouse. We were the only ones in the camp facility, as there was nothing else valuable that had to be watched overnight. My buddy and I had tied hammocks between the vehicles to get a bit more comfortable for the overnight watch. When we suddenly saw a pack of wild dogs standing outside the doors to the warehouse. Now, these doors were wide open, and nothing was stopping the dogs from coming in at all. But they just stood there. 15 to 20 dogs lined up at the entrance to the abandoned warehouse, watching us. Suddenly, as if someone had flipped a switch, they all started barking and howling in our direction. I say our direction, because when I discussed it later with him, we both agreed that it felt like the dogs were barking at something else in the entirely abandoned warehouse. My buddy and I were completely terrified. First, that we might have gotten swarmed by dogs, and second, whatever those dogs were barking at. We started to radio for help, but suddenly the pack of dogs stopped barking and left. It was as if they were never there. That was a long night of guard duty, I can tell you. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. But before we go any further, a huge thank you to all military, men and women, anyone in the armed forces. You guys do a terrific job and it really is appreciated. So thank you for your service. I'd also like to thank all the amazing and wonderful people who have signed up to be my patrons. Their names can be seen on screen, and if you'd like your name on screen, as well as some awesome rewards, feel free to check out the link to Patreon. You get some pretty cool stuff, if, if you want. In any case, I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. I really enjoyed the first set of stories. You know, like the first half hour nearly. Yeah, some, some really good ones. I'd never even heard of that team before. Reminded me a lot of the Captain Phillips movie. Very tense movie if you guys have seen it. So yes, if, uh, if anything spooky or scary has ever happened to you, feel free to send it to my email or my Reddit, either are fine. And, uh, and yeah, maybe we'll make it into a video one day. Just be sure to put in plenty of punctuation, good grammar and stuff. That's always helpful. But yeah, like I said at the start, if you're interested in checking out Skillshare, it really is pretty good. Really good. I honestly recommend it. And, um, and yeah, two months for free, guys. Come on, just click the link. It's awesome. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off now. So stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.